So how many of you has a Twitter account? All of you? Nope. Some of you? So did you know that Twitter actually, you can buy the Twitter stock from today? It's IPO, initial whatever, public offer whatever. So these guys, it's a little small font right there. It's not really related to the air pollution at all, but I realized this can be a good um, way to explain about mixing ratio and number density. So these are three kind of big guys in Twitter company. So Evan Williams, uh, Richard Costello, whatever, and then Jack Dorsey, and then this guy is this guy right here. So this guy looks very happy, right? So just today, from the stock market, he got the uh, $351 million for this stock deal, right? So this was the uh, uh, capture of the today's New York Times, somewhere around 9 a.m., something like that. So they got, just today, this much of money. And then I open my wallet and then take a look at how many cash that I have. <laughs> I got the uh, $13. So. So this is, by definition, you can just think of this it as the uh, number density, number of the uh, molecules of air in given volume, okay? So uh, I will try to calculate mixing ratio of my tiny, tiny of money compared with this big money, okay? So that's billion and that's million, right? So this guy right here, co-founder of Twitter, got how much of money? 2.6 times 10 to 9, by definition, billion dollars today. How much I have? 13, right? So 2.6, 13, 10 to minus 9. But that's, by definition, parts per billion, right? So let's see, 26, 113. And then we can just call it PPV here if we assume uh, dollar is the, uh, the molecule. So what is this thing? So um, this is basically, uh, so 13, 13. So basically five PPV. So if we assume then dollar bill is L molecule, Compare with yeah, this guy's just today's income, the money I got in my wallet is five PPB, okay? So how about this guy, this smiley guy right here? It has, he earned $351 million today. So 351 minus 13, 10 to six. So 350, 13, and two minus six. So that's by definition PPM, right? Now I need a little help here. What's the number? Anybody has calculator? A computer? 13 divided by 350. Zero point zero three. Seven ppm, right? Compared with this guy right here. So basically, what it can do even is that basically this is 0.351 times 10 to 9. Then this is going to be 37 ppb, right? So let's get into some science part. So you guys are very excited when I talk about money and then. Uh, Let's get into uh, L molecule part here. So uh, we talked about, so I think one of the uh, exam question was about why EPA regulate ozone concentration in mixing ratio, not number density, right? So pressure and altitude. And then we know that pressure decrease exponentially as you go up high, right? So that's why 
in Denver, which is one mile altitude, has about, so it shouldn't be about here. One mile of altitude has 0.8 ATM. So it's 80% of air molecules in given volume. So basically you can think that so different places has different uh, pressure. So, so to compare evenly, we need to use that um, this mixing ratio scale to uh, kind of uh, uh, leveling the different number of air molecule compared with my tiny, tiny of money that's sitting in my uh, wallet. So that's the main reason. Is that this money analogy make you help to understand better in terms of mixing ratio? Or it just makes you even more confusing? This is better or worse? I don't know. I was trying at least. So that was the answer. And then I got a question about that. Is there still, uh, we can review the midterm. Uh, yeah, sure, until end of the uh, um, quarter, I'm willing to review your um, midterm if you visit my office during the office hour or by appointment. So, so come see me if you have any question about your midterm, all right? So let's go ahead with my... Let me try again. So we will, today we'll talk about indoor air pollution and acid rain. Then why we are talking about indoor air pollution? If we take a look at statistics and global statistics, then um, the casualty, the death from indoor air pollution are far much larger number than the uh, air pollution outside that we have discussed so far. Even uh, compared with climate change, uh, that's far much more larger number in terms of number of deaths per year. So that's very vital part of the uh, air pollution um, to understand uh, societal, societal implication of the uh, air pollution. So there's a couple of figures, photos, about uh, uh, this old burning parts you tend to keep uh, inside of your house. So basically running engine, fireplace, this gas heater and the gas stove, and then this kerosene heater. So what kind of a gas species this burning process can emit, you think, in terms of air pollutants? Carbon, what? <laughs> yes, that's carbon monoxide. So that's basically all this thing using organic compound as a fuel, right? Fire, obviously complete combustion, it's gonna uh, emitting CO2, but usually CO2 never gets accumulated that higher concentration that can uh, really bad, harm, uh, harmful to you. But CO, which is coming from incomplete combustion, can actually uh, accumulate inside of the house and then they can actually uh, eventually kill you. So that's the, uh, uh, um, some uh, indoor air pollutants, CO, it's important indoor air pollutants. And then um, in house, there's a lot of uh, plywood and then we tend to uh, putting a lot of solvents and then paints, things like that. And then those kind of things can emit VOCs to the atmosphere, indoor air. Then another thing, if you have a microscope, and then uh, you know this kind of thing can actually sitting in your pillowcase, your blanket, things like that. So once you go back to house today, just all just clean it up, wash it out. <laughs> so that's the message. That is this just try to make you scary kind of thing. And then all those other stuff. The sweet sweet home is actually a pretty dangerous place if you take a look at this thing. Um, it's during the springtime, pollen can rolling in your house and then fungal spore, things like that. Even bacteria and virus, why, why the, uh, uh, the virus, the, uh, it's kind of a, why we have a kind of infectious disease because virus can be traveling uh, through the uh, um, atmosphere. So if you count this kind of infectious disease kind of thing, 
uh, that uh, trend, uh, kind of uh, um, infected through the uh, atmosphere, then it can be uh, air pollution too, right? So um, did I skip that thing? Oh, actually, we need to take a look at one thing there. Mm. So let me actually take a look at one more thing, the website. We're supposed to be supposed to take a look at the website. Uh, oh, here. So uh, EPA has a nice website that summarizes the source of air pollutants in your sweet, sweet home. So this is very, very nice looking home. Weather is great, you know, the cloud is rolling along. Very peaceful, but if you take a look at the uh, uh, inside, for example, bedroom, those dust mites that we already saw that are uh, microscopic photos, also your pillowcase and your blanket, things like that has this kind of thing. So this is a bedroom. And then let's move along to the bathroom. The mold can be uh, rolling along. Obviously this can be uh, bad for your uh, lung health, things like that, that's one thing. Even in the living room, the carbon monoxide, that's nice looking cozy uh, uh, fireplace. You probably miss this kind of thing, this time of the season can emit carbon monoxide. So uh, you you want to uh, put some carbon monoxide detector in your house. And then uh, this pet thing has a pet dander and hair can emit it to the atmosphere. And what is, oh, cigarette. So a uh, secondhand smoke can be a big thing, although if you, you are not a uh, smoker, if you have a smoker in your household, uh, that can actually be uh, bad for you. That can be bad for you. And then kitchen. So even um, fruits can, uh, some uh, pesticide residue can stay in the fruit that can be evaporate uh, inside, the, uh, uh, inside of the house because the air inside the house is kind of isolated so it can be accumulated to the atmosphere, right? So um, the sink counter, there's some uh, detergent, a cleaner, things like that. That's actually VOCs uh, because, so uh, once you smell something, that means that there's a, a volatile organic compound actually reach your nose and then that, uh, that's how you sense the uh, smell. So uh, this kind of detergent, cleaner, things like that also emits uh, uh, VOCs to the atmosphere, so uh, if you are sensitive, then uh, this can be an even problem. So obviously this stove thing can emit the uh, carbon monoxide too. So this is kitchen. So, to, and uh, in California, there's not many houses has basement, but most of places has basement. So let's take a look at what can be a, what can be a um, potential dangerous stuff in the basement. So mold can be, a, uh, because usually a basement uh, it's wet, so mold can be a problem. So what is this thing? Radon, so we'll discuss about radon, in, especially in the basement. A lot of radon can be smearing into uh, your house. And then uh, this is carbon monoxide, the uh, water heater, things like that uh, can, uh, because that's burning process again, the carbon monoxide can be uh, coming out from this burning process. And then a lot of people actually store their uh, paints in the basement, then uh, that can emit the uh, VOC. So this is summary for the uh, um, air pollution. Okay, so radon. So in the basement, always radon uh, become a problem. So radon is basically gas. And then, um, so um, from the uh, bad rock, it can be smeared into the space, especially in the basement. Also, it can smear into the water line, and then uh, it can just get into the uh, uh, house through the uh, water. So we talked about radioactivity. So radioactivity is that basically the atom is unstable, so it decomposes to more stable atom, and then by that uh, decomposition is associated with uh, the emission of this energetic particle. Uh, there's uh, three energy particles we are interested in. One is alpha particle, <coughs> which is two proton and two neutron, and beta particle has one electron, 
and then gamma is just rays, and the X-ray is one of these things too. So, um, so this radon is coming from uranium out here, and then this is what is called half-life. So if there's a hundred atom of the uranium-238, uh, is currently right here, then about 4.5 time, uh, 4.5 times 10 to 9 years, which is 4.5 uh, billion years, then half of this uranium will become thorium, and then will emit alpha particle by that decaying process, okay? This is uh, how you can read this thing. So uranium becomes thorium, and then it just uh, decomposes into all the way down to um, ra radon right here. Oh, actually, right here. This is actually rad radium, and then this radon. Yeah, radon right here. So radon is gas, and then that means that you can actually inhale this thing, and then it's sitting in your lung. It can be staying in your lung, and then about 3.8 days, it emits energetic particle called alpha particle, and then become polonium, and then uh, about three minutes after uh, this polonium uh, atom, half of them will become lead. So lead, it is, uh, lead is bad thing, uh, uh, obviously, for your health. So that's uh, uh, why uh, leadon is the bad thing um, in terms of the, uh, uh, when uh, the leadon is smearing into your basement. So this is leadon, uh, EPA actually did survey where uh, the high leadon um, exists in terms of the, uh, on the basement and then uh, in the uh, rock, things like that. So usually high leadon is uh, uh, observed in Rocky Mountain region than mostly mountain region. And usually California is relatively uh, uh, safe in terms of the uh, radon um, uh, pollution. So um, Colorado is right here. So when I uh, live in Colorado, we have to buy a house out there. And then uh, we actually did. Uh, so I think state law uh, mandate that uh, having radon survey on the basement. And then we ended up having high lead on uh, concentration in the basement. So we, I think we paid like $800 to uh, uh, set a system that can ventilate the air uh, in the basement to the outside and then the lead on level gets much stabilized. So, um, so don't get freaked out if you move to some place else, buy a, try to buy a house when our lead on level is high, then don't get freaked out. You can easily install some um, ventilation system that can knock down lead on concentration in the basement but uh, if you are thinking to move into some place, this red zone, that high uh, radon concentration, then you gotta definitely check up the radon concentration if you plan to buy a house or rent a house, things like that, okay? So this is a radon zone, mostly uh, it's relatively safe. So yellow is a low radon, and then red is high radon, except uh, Santa Barbara region, I don't know. But uh, if you plan to move out here and buy a house, mostly, uh, mostly, um, I think uh, houses in uh, California doesn't have a um, basement, but if you uh, just move into basement, things like that, in this area, you gotta check out that uh, radon concentration, okay? And then asbestos. So this is a naturally occurring uh, mineral. So uh, it has been used a lot in terms of insulation uh, material. So this is how asbestos naturally occurred. So this is uh, your quarter, so it's the size of this. Then you can, uh, you sh should be able to see that there's kind of a uh, needle shape kind of thing is uh, kind of, a, uh, that's the shape of this mineral. So if you take a look at this thing on the microscope, that uh, it is obviously, there's, it composed by really, really small needle shape kind of thing. And once this thing gets airborne, the size of this each needle is sitting somewhere between 0.1 to 10 micrometer, okay? So why size is important? Because uh, I think we went over this thing several times. Basically size matters in terms of how much, how long it can penetrate into our uh, breathing system. So basically, uh, most of the uh, really, really small particle, really, really large particle, 
a particle size higher than 10 micrometer can easily filter out nasal airway. But the particle somewhere between 0.1 micrometer to about 2.5 micrometer actually can actually get into our lung. So, uh, and then this uh, abastos happened to be needle shaped. So it'll be just sticking in our lung tissue and then never come out. So it has been used a lot in terms of insulation. So mine, the fire blanket, even brake pad. And then it was a lot, it used a lot in shipyard in terms of a ship, this insulation. So um, they use this kind of a abastos and they process abastos and then use it as a insulation. And then this is consequences. At first time we didn't know abastos actually can be bad for the health, but ended up that I think this is 2002 um, number of deaths in the US. So number one reason for the death in 2002 was AIDS, and then alcoholic liver disease. Yeah, that's pretty striking. So, um, and then uh, firearm discharge, things like that. And then after that, it was asbestos related disease, which is about 11,000 casualties, so right here. So uh, the specific reason behind of it is lung cancer, and then mesothelioma, and then some other uh, cancer. So if you watch the uh, uh, late night TV, then there's a lot of uh, actually um, commercial about that. If you have mesothelioma, call us kind of thing. Have you guys watched that thing? Yeah, that's this thing. So that's kind of a lawyer try to hook you up and then make you a big, big sue with the company who produced this thing. So that's mesothelioma is coming from this uh, abestos um, uh, pollution. And then uh, because it has been used as uh, insulation, so it is mostly uh, from the uh, uh, indoor air pollution, all right? So this is one uh, kind of dramatic uh, example that this is, have you, anybody heard about this town, Libby, Montana? It's a really, really small town. It's like 2,000 people, total population. But this town, obviously has a lot of this mineral, this vermiculite mine. So that's another part, uh, kind of mineral that has been used as uh, insulation. And then happened to have, it's kind of a mixture between this uh, uh, vermiculite and then uh, abastos. So um, there's a lot of production was going on. So one time it was 80% of world production was from this town. And then uh, it happened to be this, it, it was a mixture between abastos and then uh, this vermiculite uh, 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 mineral. And then as you can see, this relatively small town, and then this is obviously big money, and then most people who are living in this town are actually all working on that mine. And then uh, about, I told you that the overpopulation is about 2,000, and then number of death, uh, about uh, 25 years time frame, has been about 192 deaths. That's a very small town, so this is a lot of casualty. And then about 400 lung injury was reported in this town. So that's, uh, so basically these statistics indicated how bad it is that abastos um, pollution. So again, it's practical kind of information. So if you plan to buy or rent a house, I think built before 1970, then you gotta check that out, what's the insulation material. So if it is asbestos, you gotta do something. But I think most of states actually enforce to uh, replace all those uh, uh, insulation material if it is asbestos to uh, safer um, material. So you know, anyway, you gotta check that out. And then uh, the other important thing is tobacco smoke. So I hope you are not smoker uh, in this class that's for your health, and then we are smoke-free campus, whatever thing is enforced, I think, this year. So uh, if you haven't quit your smoking, I hope I can change your, my, your mind from this couple of uh, slides. So, um, so this is a, a figure that obviously you can see this smoke, which means that that's gas and particle, right? So what kind of gas and particle? Interestingly that uh, also this cigarette smoke contains a lot of particle and then uh, this uh, carbon monoxide and NOx and then all other stuff. Then this is very interesting table that compare 
that average automobile emission gram per mile. So basically this is the uh, emission of a CO, NO, and NO2, and particles, average, average uh, car running one mile. So this is total number of CO, NOx, and particle from the tailpipe if you run the uh, vehicle about one mile of a distance. So obviously CO and NOx is much high in terms of car driving. But if you compare this particle, then uh, actually this one uh, cigarette actually, uh, actually generate more particle than the car pile, uh, tailpipe running one mile. So basically, just good analogy is that basically you are just inhaling this automobile uh, tailpipe for one mile of the running when you just smoke one cigarette, okay? That's that bad, all right? So quit smoking, so that's the message right out here. So uh, another important source of the uh, indoor air pollution is indoor cook stove, which looks like just like this. So in a uh, developed world like US, this is not really problem. Not many people are actually using this kind of the uh, uh, cooking system, you know, unless you're just going out to campground and then, you know, having some coffee and cook your meal, things like that. We use this thing, but not many people are actually using this kind of cooking method in developed world. But uh, that's not the case other part of the world. So let's uh, watch a couple of the uh, uh, video related with this problem. So let's go into the front and watch this thing. My name is Peter Scott. I'm the founder of Burn Manufacturing. 20 years ago, I went to Africa. And when I saw deforestation in Africa, in Congo, I got down on my knees and wept. And I said, I'm going to devote my life to save the forests of Africa and the developing world. Many people are unaware that each year, 2 million people, mostly women and children, die from exposure to smoke from inefficient open fires. My goal was to uh, create a stove army of engineers, researchers, and designers Opportunity. So, who wants to quit their fracking job and join me? Yes, hands up. Daniel's with me. By manufacturing three million cook stoves in Africa, we're going to save thousands of lives, more than a hundred million trees. We're going to create local viable jobs, and we're going to reduce indoor air pollution for millions of women. It's an incredible. So obviously you can see that's the problem in some part of the world, especially uh, in African country. And then um, actually this is kind of a, a grassroots movement um, that uh, just uh, um, initiated by a single person. And then actually government is doing its research too. So National Science Foundation actually fund uh, this kind of research. Let's take a look at this, what this scientist should say about this thing. Um, and so that's what people currently 
really graphically for their burn would, uh, as a cultural way, uh, because that's kind of the current cooking practices that people use. So what we would like to do is um, look at how food is always used to get people to switch from cooking over open fires to cooking over cleaner, burner cooked stoves. And so we are uh, piloting the use of cooked stoves Do people actually want to use the stoves? Um, what are the cooking needs? And uh, do the cook stoves that we can introduce in this area, uh, do they have the potential to, um, to meet people's cooking needs and let people cook in a cleaner way, but also in a way that, that continues to uh, you know, meet, the, meet the needs of the population? So she was talking about that wood burning in the house, and then again, it's kind of the same process that what cause that uh, London type smoke, then uh, those kind of burning will produce uh, CO and SO2 and then uh, particles and then it's in the house environment, it's kind of isolated environment, there's no ventilation going on, especially for the uh, small kitchen, can emit a lot, of that, then that kind of environment actually, those immediate CO, SO2 and the particle can accumulate a lot, can get the uh, very high concentration in there, right? So that was the, uh, this part. Okay, let's move ahead. So, once you have a job and then, uh, um, and then working on the industry, things like that, and then uh, obviously uh, we discussed about that ozone um, uh, regulation level, which is 75 ppb for eight hour average. That is enforced by EPA. But uh, indoor workplace standard is not regulated by EPA, it's um, regulated by uh, OSHA standards for the so Occupational Safety and Health Administration. So if you have any problem in the air quality, in your job, things like that, then you gotta take a look at the OSHA homepage rather than EPA homepage. So that's the main uh, message in this uh, slides. So as you can see here, so let's just take a look at this NO2 level. So EPA, so basically, uh, that's EPA, and that's California, and then this is EPA standard, and then this is OSHA standard. So for the uh, uh, eight hour, OSHA standard is one ppm, and then uh, EPA standard is 83 ppb, 0.83 ppm, this is annual, and then one hour is 18 ppm, so obviously NO2 concentration outside uh, regulation level is much tougher than indoor level because there's no possibility NO2 actually produce ozone indoor environment because there's no sunlight, so that's why the regulation level is still higher, actually much higher than outside regulation level. So that's um, the um, kind of differences. Different regulation apply to different environment so obviously different administration regulate the uh, different kind of thing here. So let's move to the, uh, um, some science stuff, acid rain. So um, you guys probably heard a lot about the acid rain. So that's here what we call it uh, acid deposition. So rain is just one event. The reason we call it deposition is that actually uh, some, uh, something like uh, fog, things like that can be very, uh, acidic, and then those kind of fog can also uh, affect it on the uh, uh, ground ecosystem. Also, for example, snow, you know, snow can be coming down if it is acidic, and then it can be melted, and then can destroy the uh, trees, things like that. So uh, we want to include, kind of we want to comprehensive term that anything coming from the uh, sky that get acidified by the uh, human pollution, so we uh, call this thing as acid deposition instead of acid rain. So this is more uh, kind of comprehensive term, okay? So uh, we talked about coal started used about uh, 1200 um, for um, making uh, lime cleans, which is kind of building, which is uh, a material for the building material. And then that emits sulfur, which is SO2, and then nitrogen oxide, which is NO2 to the atmosphere, right? And then, um, also, this SO2 eventually becomes the uh, sulfur dioxide, uh, is this sulfur dioxide and it becomes sulfuric acid. And then uh, people start to realize this acid, 
acid deposition from sulfuric acid and nitric acid from NO2 actually uh, make a problem uh, on the ground. And then the real, uh, uh, the, this acid deposition uh, problem uh, become a real problem in about the late 1700s when a chemist developed the uh, method to uh, make the uh, soda ash. So what's the soda ash for? To make a soap. So basically, if you just dissect the soap, that nice smelly soap that you use every day, maybe every hour, if you uh, worry about the uh, infectious disease, whatever thing. Actually, it's kind of, if you just dissect the, uh, the uh, components, then you need soda ash, and then you need animal fat. And then this photo basically shows you where that animal fat coming from, right? And then how we can make the soda ash to make the soap, this uh, chemical processes. So basically uh, in high temperature, so this is a, a chemical engineer uh, named Lublang, and then he developed this process to make soda ash. So if you are, if you are afraid of this, all those chemicals, what you need to remember is to use high temperature so uh, some burning process is going on, right? This high process temperature is what that means. And then it use sulfuric acid out here to generate the soda ash. And then it is making HCl, which is very um, strong acid, okay? Probably you can remember that part, I guess, I hope. So um, it is burning, probably coal out there, so it is it's gonna be generate a lot of uh, uh, CO, SO2, things like to the atmosphere. And then uh, it is using sulfuric acid, which is very strong acid. And then it is also by product, uh, HCl gas phase HCl is emitting to the atmosphere. So these are source for acid uh, precipitation um, because they are strong acid, okay? So that's, this is summary. So if uh, sulfuric acid and HCl, and then these are byproduct of the uh, coal burning. And then another coal, uh, another uh, byproduct, it was gypsum, which is a uh, mineral so <coughs> composed by this thing. So if you take a look at the uh, old photos near that this soda ash factory, you can see there are this pile of gypsums everywhere uh, from um, this uh, chemical process. So this, kind of, this is kind of a visual thing. This happened to be solid you can see the pile of gypsum, but what you should able to see from this process is that this is solid, so we can see it, but these gas phase pieces, although we cannot see these guys, HCl and sulfuric acid, and then NOx and then uh, some particle, actually, although we cannot see it, those things actually sitting in the atmosphere and then making acid rain, okay? So that's another pile of gypsum. So again, this is bi good visual indication that there's a lot of HCl and sulfuric acid is sitting in the atmosphere. Then if there's a rain event, then those kind of acid is gonna be dissolved into the rain, and then it's gonna be, uh, will get affected by that acid rain, okay? So that's the when a uh, soda ash factory is going on, there's a lot of uh, kind of processes going on, right? So immediately after, after this Lublang uh, process uh, kind of developed and patented, people start using a lot this process to make soap, right? So once you, you start using soap, you cannot stop using soap, right? You gotta using soap because that kind of clean feeling, you cannot never forget about it, right? So people just kept producing that uh, soap all the time. So um, that immediately after, after all, 40 years after uh, that process first patented, people realized it actually destroyed crop and then interfere hunting. Probably hunting was really big deal back then. We are not really worried about hunting that much, but basically this indicate that uh, it affect on our daily living. And then if you remember that definition of uh, air pollution, basically if that uh, uh, human made um, gas or aerosol, if that affects on our daily life, daily life, then that's by definition uh, air pollution, right? So that was mainly HCl. So again, we cannot really go back to the life without soap once we start to use soap. So people, what people are usually doing is that kind of uh, developing technology can need of the HCl. So uh, about 1860, 
uh, engineer, one, one William uh, Kosach, developed the, uh, the scrubber that can remove HCL from the um, stack of the, uh, the soda ash company. So this is modern day HCL scrubber. So this kind of a gigantic thing. And then when uh, air is passing through this scrubber, so H HCL can be removed from the, uh, um, that uh, exhaust so that um, the uh, air without HCL can be emitted to the, uh, um, to the uh, outside, okay? So even better solution is that uh, kind of developing new chemical mechanism that doesn't produce any HCL, right? So that's, uh, that was done by on survey. So survey process, so this is survey process using a totally different um, uh, material, CaCO3. So if you take a look at these processes, you cannot find any acid in this process, right? You cannot find HCl, you cannot find H2SO4. So this process basically uh, doesn't emit any uh, 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 strong acid to the atmosphere. So at least the problem of the acid precipitation from HCl uh, solved uh, by uh, uh, adopting this new chemical processes. But obviously we know that after uh, this, uh, we solve this problem, HCL problem, still uh, uh, the acid rain, acid precipitation is the problem. So we will discuss about uh, that thing, but yeah, what the other uh, chemical compound actually affects on the uh, um, um, ca uh, acid uh, precipitation. So this is a guy who looks like criminal, he's not a really nice looking guy, but uh, he's father of acid rain, very, very environmental, environment friendly kind of guy. He studied a lot about the acid rain, so it's for the, uh, your um, knowledge. So I try to introduce this guy who addressed a lot of questions related with the acid rain uh, back uh, in uh, uh, 1800, right? So to understand uh, acid rain, uh, we need to understand acidity. And then uh, we really want, we just scientists love to quantify everything. So we really need to know, we really hate the idea about the, the acidity is high or low. So high, if it is high, how high? And then if it is low, how low? That's why we love numbers. So I will introduce some numbers today. So um, basically that we call it pH. So that's kind of a, a concentration of the uh, H plus in the solution. So basically you can, uh, you can think that this parenthesis indicate that uh, uh, concentration. So this parenthesis H plus means that concentration of H plus in the water, all right? So why we are putting this real thing in front of H plus? Because to make our life you know, easier, at least to me, but to make life your life more miserable <laughs> maybe in terms of uh, uh, under to understand this log scale. But it is not really too difficult term. It's more like this. So usually the concentration of this H plus is very, very low. How low? In the neutral water, concentration of H plus is 10 to minus seven, right? So what we want to do is that we just want to take this seven away instead of write this whole thing. So what this log base 10 is doing out there is that take this thing, just take this thing to, um, to the, uh, this pH scale. So if you put the log 10 in front of this very, very small number, then it will become minus seven. So we just bring this thing into right here. But we don't want to use minus, so put the minus in front of it, so make this thing plus. So that's how log is working in terms of the uh, number notation, right? So that's that. So uh, because we're putting minus in front of log, so that's the important part. So lower pH means higher concentration of the H plus, right? So because of this minus thing. So lower pH means more acidic, and then higher pH means uh, 
less acidic. We call it uh, basic, okay? So let's do uh, this thing. Let's play with this uh, uh, little quiz here. So we learn about log. Let's apply that thing. So A, solution A has pH 5. Solution B has pH 7. What's the uh, concentration ratio of the H plus in solution A and solution B? I'll help you a little bit. A, H plus B, pH A, 5, B, 7, 10 to minus 5, 10 to minus 7. So, A, B, Right? It's all here. We got everything, all right, 47, 48. Ooh, that's competing answer, even A. Please, so that's, so, so it should be 100, right? So what's the right number, C? Yeah, at least. Yeah, that's the most dominant number anyway. For only 38%, by, I hope by end of the, uh, um, this quarter, before you take the, uh, your final, I hope you can understand this thing, okay? You know what I mean, right? So, anybody still confusing? It's pretty straightforward, right? You, you just want to play with me a little bit to choose the wrong answer, but did I tell you that I, I can actually see the name of the what kind of answer you choose? So, you what up? You gotta keep in mind about that fact. All right, so let's move ahead. So acidity, I talked about that uh, the water, which is, if it is only water, basically neutral water, has equal number of H plus and then AOH minus, and then that's 10 to minus seven, that's why neutral water has pH seven, okay? Seven is the magic number, so it's a neutral. So, um, in the world of acid, this is same as the human world. There's a, in the human world, there's strong guy and weak guy out there. But uh, in the acid world, there's also strong acid and weak acid, right? So strong acid, basically, if we uh, basically uh, define that uh, concentration of H plus determines the acidity, so a strong acid, by definition, is that these guys actually can easily uh, produce H plus when it dissolves into the water. So that's by definition strong acid. So weak acid, so this H2CO3 is not as uh, strong as the, uh, this sulfuric acid and HCl. That means that uh, this acid uh, actually uh, make less H plus when it dissolves into the water. So that's the definition of the strong acid and weak acid. And then uh, any um, uh, substance that takes H plus away, for example, this ammonia, can take the H plus away from the uh, uh, solution, and then it becomes NH4 plus, so that's why this is basic, and then, or it can produce, when it produces the OH minus, it is also a base. So we call it alkali, but we will more focus on the acid during this class, okay? So this is the range of the pH that uh, some different uh, waters around the nature. So um, this is uh, kind of a seawater, uh, sli slightly basic. So uh, the uh, pH level is about 7.8 to uh, 8.3. Even the natural rainwater is slightly acidic. So uh, pH range is about four, uh, 5 to 5.6. So uh, we call it acid rain when as, uh, the concentration of H plus, so pH level below 5. So that's definition 
of acid rain. So usually it is observed about two to 5.6 of the pH level for the acid level. Uh, I said, uh, I, I, should, I, I should change the, uh, this number right here. So somewhere between two to five is acid rain range by definition, okay? So why uh, rainwater is slightly acidic? So anybody remember what's the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere? Good number, anybody can say to about the uh, CO2 concentration? Anybody? I will give, give you the uh, number. What's the unit? What? A uh, little more, a little higher. PPM. PPM, right. So that's uh, parts per million, right? So there's a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, and then they can dissolve into the water. And then it can produce, what is this thing? That's acid, and then that's relatively weak acid, right? So uh, that's why it's slightly acidic. And then we talked about there's strong acid and then weak acid. And then this acid, carbonic acid, is weak acid. So that's why a rainwater is slightly acidic. And then this is a little side story that uh, we worried about CO2 concentration because it will increase the temperature of the, over the Earth because, um, because that's a greenhouse gas. Also, if we have too much of CO2 in the atmosphere, actually it will dissolve into the seawater and then it will acidify the seawater. So that's another environmental problem that we will discuss when we discuss about the uh, uh, global climate change, which is I think two weeks away, something like that. So uh, some of the food's pH, so if you take a look at this thing, the pH from uh, a soda, a soda is very acidic thing. For example, Coke and then Pepsi, its pH is about 2.5. It's kind of the strongest acid rain you can think about is this kind of pH range. So, so today the two lesson, if you're just sleepy, don't smoke and then don't drink too much of soda. So that's <laughs> two lesson. But uh, that's not gonna be showing up in your final, so. But you know, that'll be good for your whole life, so you know, that's a good thing, I guess. So some other stuff, that pH of the food, but some kind of something you, you can, you, it's good to know about this kind of uh, uh, numbers because you now understand what pH means. So uh, let's talk about uh, uh, modern day acid rain problem. So modern day acid rain problem is actually from sulfuric acid. So we know where sulfuric acid is coming from, right? The coal burning, right? So coal burning emit SO2 in the atmosphere, and then uh, the chemical process in the atmosphere make sulfuric acid. But this is a uh, uh, kind of observation result from 1971 to 2010, and SO2 concentration. It was really, really problem back then in early 17, uh, 1970, that SO2 concentration is too high, so again, this SO2 eventually become H2SO4, which is sulfuric acid. So this is precursor for uh, acid rain. So high SO2 means more sulfuric acid means more acid rain. So we address really good in developed world, especially in the US and in Europe. Uh, we decrease the SO2 level not by less burning uh, coal, more like uh, they have a better technology. We, we discussed about the, about the clean coal technology. So we emit less SO2 to the atmosphere so that uh, this acid rain problem actually gets better past about 30 years. So this is comparison between carbonic acid. So this is weak acid. So it just produces less H plus than uh, sulfuric acid. So that's why sulfuric acid is strong uh, acid and then uh, cause the uh, uh, acid rain problem, okay? That's all you need to know. So, and then the other uh, acid, the strong acid we talked about, uh, HCl, so that this, pro this was a really big problem when that Leblanc process was operating, but it's not really using anymore, so HCl is not really a problem. Nitric acid can be a problem, but not, it's, currently it's not really a big problem yet. So this, where is this nitric acid coming from, HNO3? 
So that's from NO2, from the call, OH, and then HNO3 is coming from. So this can be also precursor for acid rain. So I try to explain all this chemical kind of a mechanism that how SO2 is becoming sulfuric acid, but I realize that's not really good idea to really care about the uh, chemistry, things like that, uh, like you guys, rather. So I just try to really go back to basic thing. So basically this is oxidation, all right? So how do we know this is oxidation? So if you take a look at this sulfur and nitrogen, it used to have two oxygen each, right? So how many oxygen this guy have so for now? Four. There's more oxygen, right? This is not really scientifically the right way to describe it, but easier to understand this thing. So how many oxygen this nitrogen has? Three. So this guy now has more oxygen, right? So this is call it oxidation. So when air pollutants get into the atmosphere, what is happening is oxidation. And then if you just take a look at this compound and this compound, sulfur happen to add more ox oxygen here. And nitrogen now have, has more oxygen in this form, right? So oxidation is kind of a natural processes, right? So if you take a look at all those kind of thing, antioxidants kind of thing, that's all related. So People are just putting all those cosmetics in the skin too, and then they claim that that's antioxidant, which means that that kind of slow down your aging process. So aging process is also oxidation, oxidation processes, and then people try to eat all those uh, berries, nuts, things like that, and then people claim that that's antioxidant. So by definition, it means that slow down your aging, right? So, um, so basically, our pe we people are also getting oxidized in the world, and then which means by which just by definition that's aging, and then this air pollutants also getting old, and then uh, getting oxidized, and then these guys are water soluble, and then they are removed fr from the atmosphere, right, uh, by the uh, rain things like that. Basically, this pollutants died from the atmosphere as it get aged, it get oxidized, right? So, understand? Yeah. So people hate aging, probably your age, aging is not really big problem, not in scope. And then uh, once you get to 21, 22 something, once you get to the ball, and then after the alcoholic beverage, you get called, and then you're kind of annoyed by that, why are these guys asking the call things like that? But once you get to my age, people start to not asking the uh, photo ID, you start eating this antioxidant and then putting this stuff in the face <laughs> to getting younger, so that's life. So, so everything is related, so that's what I'm trying to say here. So um, if you are a science geek, then you can take a look at this thing, and then this is SO2 right here, and then SO4 right here. Actually, really right way to describe this oxidation is calculating oxidation number. So SO2, this oxygen has minus two, so that's minus four, that's plus four here. And then that's minus eight, H is plus one, so minus six. So basically sulfur oxidation states uh, uh, change bet between, uh, from, um, uh, that's plus six, right? So plus four to plus six, that's the right description in terms of science world. But uh, in your world, I think it will be just fine just air pollutants getting old and then died from the atmosphere and then removed by the rain, okay? And then that caused the acid rain, the um, problem um, in terms of air pollution problem, right? So I have 20 more minutes. So you can just read from this thing. So that's really a scientific exact description about uh, oxidation of a surf compound um, in the atmosphere. So there are two ways to uh, actually we can oxidize this sulfur in the atmosphere. One is gas-based process that um, is done by the OH radical producing sulfuric acid. The other one is actually this SO2 dissolved into the water 
and then producing sulfuric acid. So what you need to remember is that there's two different ways to produce sulfuric acid um, in the atmosphere, and the sulfuric acid is important precursor for uh, acid rain, right? So uh, that's all you need to remember. This is how you can make nitric acid. So let's take a look at the consequences of this acid rain problem. So um, in early 1970, so pH gets all the way down to a lot of times we observe pH 1 in 1950 and 1960 all the way up to 1970. So for the uh, perspective, to give you some perspective, so what's the uh, uh, natural condition of pH of the rainwater? pH is 5, right? So H plus is about 10 to minus 5. Uh, concentration, pH one, one means H plus is 10 to minus one. So this is 10,000 times higher in terms of H plus concentration in pH one uh, level uh, in terms of rainwater in natural condition. If you uh, compare with the uh, uh, neutral water, which is pH 7, which is uh, 10 to minus 7. So this is pH 7, right? So that's about um, 100 times, uh, so 10 to 6. So a million times higher in terms of the H plus concentration. So that was that bad. Although if you compare with the 1 and 7, it looks like a very close number. But if you take a look at the uh, real uh, definition of the pH, that's million times higher H plus concentration in the, uh, in the uh, uh, lake water or the uh, stream, the rain, um, the river water. So that obviously affects on plant. So you can read this thing, so you can just basically affect on the root system and then if just uh, a tree, uh, tree's roots get damaged, then basically tr uh, trees is dying from this thing. So this is the uh, emission of the uh, coal burning power plant. So this contains a lot of SO2 that will produce uh, sulfuric acid in the atmosphere. So these are consequences. This is Czech Republic of uh, 2005. Even, even, uh, even in the 2005, uh, acid rain was the problem in mid uh, European country. So a lot of trees died because of the, uh, this acid rain that basically affected on root system for these trees, okay? So again, Czech Republic, you can see some dying trees here and there. This is 1995. And then again, the Czech Republic, and then there's dead spruce here and there, all because of the acid rain. So again, all those sad photos, even in Germany in the early 1900s. So even in Germany, there was a big problem in acid rain, even in the 19, early 1900s, 1990. But uh, now they uh, uh, address this problem by reducing SO2 uh, concentration in the atmosphere. So uh, in UK, so a lot of trees got died, and then all those kind of uh, uh, acid, the acid kind of uh, kind of dissolve all those uh, uh, material tree material. Then you can see the uh, the color of this water has actually changed quite a bit because the acid actually dissolved some of the uh, the tree parts, and then a lot of organic material actually dissolved in this water. That's why uh, it, does, it has different color. So there's a couple of way that you can address this problem by engineering. Uh, by applying so, some um, base alkali material to the water, you can actually neutralize uh, lake water. So um, what, uh, people use the ammonium hydroxide and then uh, uh, calcium carbonate and then to remove the uh, H plus from the water. So uh, I think this photo is coming from, I think, 70 in Scandinavian uh, uh, Peninsula, actually this, uh, uh, Helicopter actually spraying those uh, alkal alkali material to the water so that uh, remove H plus from the water. So this is one way you can do. So um, you can put the uh, NaCl by taking H plus away from the water and then putting ammonia. Probably it is very smelly kind of a, a way to address it, but you can obviously can take the H plus away from the water. So this is one way you can do. But <coughs> Real fundamental solution to address this problem is obviously decreasing SO2 concentration in the atmosphere, which is precursor for sulfuric acid, right? So uh, if you take a look at the visibility trend in Europe, 
So this is a green region right here. So this is Spain, right? right what country is this? Is? Anybody? France, right? Germany. So this is Poland, I think. Poland and this is Czech Republic. So a lot of uh, power plants happen to be located in this borderline between Germany and then uh, Czech and Poland. So if you take a look at the red and then blue places, so this is visibility. So we uh, discussed about the visibility. So as you can see, visibility was really horrible in this blue region, in Poland region, out there back in early 70s because of that all those emissions from the power plants produced particle in the atmosphere and then SO2, actual particle decreased the visibility as you can see here. And then also the SO2 can make the sulfuric acid and then uh, that uh, caused the acid rain problem and then it just killed all the trees on the ecosystem, right? But if you take a look at the visibility trend, actually it gets much better this day by reducing SO2 emission in this area. So um, in the uh, uh, Czech and then uh, this Germany borderline too, actually uh, the uh, visibility gets much better. But if you take a look at this nice beach cities in France, there's not much of the uh, uh, power plants beginning. So visibility is about the same, right? So you can learn this if, if you take a look at the different region and different industry and then visibility trend, you can actually take a, uh, a, a kind of a guess that how, how, what kind of improvement has been done in different region. So this is in the US. So this is 1994, this is 2009, and then this is pH. Higher pH means that less acidic, right? Lower pH means more acidic, right? So basically uh, in the eastern, uh, western part of the US, it has been pretty clean, but uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, acid rain, acid precipitation. But really big problem has been Ohio Valley region because there's a lot of coal burning power plant had to happen to be located in this region. So in 1994, the pH level gets down to 4.2. And then uh, we talked about in natural rain has pH level about 5.5, which is about this range. So if, if it is green, that's natural condition. But if you start to see some faded green and then this red region, that's by definition acid rain, right? So as you can see, we uh, improved the acid rain problem quite a bit by uh, removing SO2 emission from the power plants. So 2009 um, observation indicate that most of the um, uh, country even most of the, uh, uh, the uh, eastern part of the US, southeast part, and then uh, this Ohio Valley region uh, improved quite a bit in terms of the pH level of the rainwater. So how we can achieve, achieve it? And then as I uh, discussed, uh, uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, if we uh, set the 1970 level of the SO2 emission as a uh, reference level, we knocked down SO2 emission by 76% by adapting um, um, new technology. So this is, uh, I think 2010, most recent observation. So still there's some uh, lower pH observed in the Wild Valley and then in Southeast part of the US, but uh, it gets improved quite a bit. So if you compare still, so this is the power plant distribution all over the country. So a uh, different size of this circle means that how much electricity that each power plant generated. So you can see that this uh, a lot of power plants, uh, coal burning power plants located in the Ohio Valley region, some in uh, east, uh, eastern part of Texas, then southeast part of the US. So basically you can see the correlation between lower pH and then higher uh, electricity production from the power plant. So we already discussed about this thing. So a lot of uh, uh, kind of a um, historic uh, statue, things like that, was made by the uh, marble and limestone. And then if you uh, take a look at the chemical composition of the marble and limestone, that's all calcium carbonate. And then they can be dissolved by the, uh, this hydrogen ion. So basically high pH water, acidic water, can dissolve this uh, calcium carbonate uh, which is marble and limestone. So you can see that outside of the marble and limestone can be um, 
uh, eroded by this acid rain. So this is early 1930 in Pittsburgh when uh, acid rain gets a problem, there's more acid rain what gets more acidic and acidic and acidic. A lot of building material got eroded, as you can see. A lot of historic statue, so she basically lost her face because the uh, acid rain, okay? So there's a couple of uh, regulation, things like that from the 1970, so that's why we set the reference time point as a nice, still I have 10 more minutes, wake up. Um, 1970 because we started regulation in 1970. So uh, that was the highest point in terms of SOT emission. And then we watched, uh, achieved quite a bit thanks to that clean, uh, clean Air Act, things like that in terms of the uh, reducing pH in the rainwater. So that's the specific uh, method of the uh, controlling emission. We use a low sulfur core. And then uh, uh, from the starting material, we using the uh, uh, coal that has less sulfur, and then if there's uh, some residual uh, sulfur in the coal that uh, should be emitted at SO2, then we just uh, use the, some scrubber technology to reduce uh, SO2 uh, from, the, uh, uh, from their stack. So actually, if you take a look at this pH distribution in 1994, there's a lot of uh, uh, low pH acidic rain is located in uh, uh, Hawaii Valley region happened to be uh, faced with the uh, 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 Canadian border. And then in from the early 70s, it was a big problem with the uh, US and Canada. So can Canada basically is, uh, blame uh, the US side. But <coughs> their acid rain problem actually is transboundary SO2 make their acid rain and then they just fought over over 10 years then finally in 1983, they reached an agreement, they got a study together, things like that. So once that uh, problem, that the solution of the uh, SO2 emission control is came and then adopted the technology, then we don't you know, fight about the, uh, this s rain anymore, at least uh, US and Canada. But if you take a look at the uh, wide, you know, larger scope, some parts of the world, this SO2 emission is still a problem. So this is, it's hard to see, but basically this is East Asia. So that's China. So that's Korea, this tiny country where I'm from. This is Japan. So again, this is China, Korea, and Japan. So this is SO2 emission. Basically red means more SO2, and then uh, blue means no SO2 emission, right? So more red means more SO2 emission. You can clearly see that SO2 emission over to China and India actually increased past eight years. So now their turn start fight over the uh, transboundary air pollution. So right now there's big argument going on among that uh, country like China, Korea, and Japan, and then uh, they start to blame uh, all the SO2 coming from the, uh, the west part of, uh, of their country uh, happened to be China in this case. So that's the kind of a dip diplomatic problem out in Asia these days. So I think this is the last slide. 